All right, let me uh, pass out a few more verses if I could. Jazz, can you look at um, 1 Kings 8, verse 46? And Abner, Psalm 14, 2 and 3. Yeah, please. And Stephanie, Psalm 53, 3. And Aretha, Psalm 133, verse 3. Michelle, Psalm 143, 2. Joyce, um, Proverbs 20, verse 9. And Claudia, Ecclesiastes 7, 20. John, Isaiah 53, 3 through 6. I'm sorry, Isaiah 53, verse 6. And Vladimir, Romans 3, 9 through 19. Christine, Galatians 3, 22. And uh, I think that's, that's enough for now, even though I didn't give Audra and Katie one. I know y'all are heartbroken over that. Yeah. Um, th- this slide is just trying to show that sin is universal. So the Bible over and over again says sin is a universal problem. In other words, sin has affected every human being except one, Jesus. <laughs> but notice, uh, and I'm not going to make comments on all these verses, but just notice the universality of the issue as these verses are being read. 1 Kings 8, 46. When they sin against you, for there is no man who does not sin, and you are angry with them and deliver them to an enemy so that they take them away captive to the land of the enemy far or near. Okay, not if they sin against you, when they sin against you. Then there's that little parenthetical statement, for there's no man that doesn't sin. So it's a pretty universal issue, isn't it? This issue of sin. Psalm 14, 2 and 3. It says, The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Pretty, pretty sweeping language, right? Mm-hmm. Psalm 53, 3. Every one of them has turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. So no one who does good, not even one. Um, Psalm, uh, was that 53, 3? Psalm 130, verse 3. So if God is going to call people to account, who could stand? Answer, nobody. Psalm 143, verse 2. And do not enter into judgment with your servant, for in your sight no man living is righteous. So who's righteous? No one, no, one, no man living. So, uh, Proverbs, and I'm just showing you these to show you this is this universal sin issue is taught all the way through the Bible. Proverbs 20, verse 9. Who can say that? No one. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 20. Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and whoever never sins. So is there anybody righteous on earth who never sins? No. Isaiah 53, verse 6. So who has gone to his own way? Each of us. The the Lord has laid the iniquity of us all on him. And what you find Paul doing in that large section there where he um, is 
uh, explaining sin and its uh, universal consequences is he's just quoting these passages over and over again. So that so a lot of these verses sound familiar because we remember what Paul says in Romans three. But go ahead and read that Romans three nine, nine through nineteen. What then are we better than they? Not at all. But we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all in this sin, as it is written. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their, th- with their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their path. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. So you see how he's just quoting those verses and building this case that all are under sin? Can you read Vladimir Romans 3.23? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So who has fallen short of the glory of God? All, all. Um, Galatians three twenty two. Yes, but the Scripture has shut up every every one on your sins, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So who is shut up under sin? Everyone. Everyone. So you know you see that sin is a universal problem. Sin is a heart problem. Um, all of us are totally depraved. And then one more thing on this section dealing with uh, the extent of sin. And this has to do with God's estimate of the lost. When God looks at lost people, what does he see? Um, it's, It's amazing to look at how the Bible describes lost people. So on the test, you know, I'll I'll ask you for some of these. I can't remember if I ask you for five or something, but I'll ask you for a number of them with scriptures that back them up. But let's pass these verses out. Audrey, can you look at Luke 19.10? And Katie, John 3.16. And I'll have you read several out of John 3, uh, Katie. Um, Vladimir, John 8.44. Uh, John, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And um, Christine, 2 Timothy 2, 26. Joyce, Colossians 1, 13. And Michelle, Acts 26, 17 and 18. Um... Claudia, 1 Corinthians 2, 14. And Jazz, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. Abner, 1 John 5, 19. Stephanie, Romans 1, 29 through 32. And uh, Aretha, Luke 18, 10 through 14. And... Uh, Back to Vladimir, Genesis 3, verse 7, and verse 21. Uh, John, Galatians 5, 11, and Christine, Philippians 3, 2 through 9. So this is a, a shocking slide here because it reveals what God sees when he sees lost people. And basically what God sees when he looks at lost people are conditions that are so deplorable that God must make some kind of move towards us. You know, God must work. And so who has Luke 19 verse 10? This is a section called God's Estimate of the Lost. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that 
So how are we described? We're, we're just called lost. That's a, have you ever been lost? Of course you have. We all have. It's a frightening thing, isn't it? You know, not knowing your way home or your way around somewhere. And spiritually, that's what we are. We're just groping around in the darkness. John 3.16 So what is my condition? I'm perishing. Can you read Katie John 3.18? So if I haven't believed in Christ, I'm already condemned as far as God is concerned. I'm I'm in a condemned state until I trust Christ. It's just that the sentence hasn't been executed yet. See, I'm convicted, but there's no sentence yet. The sentence comes later, but it's inevitable. John 3, 19 through 21 Yeah, uh, go, go ahead, Katie, read that, if you don't mind. And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. But everyone that does evil has the light, has, but everyone that does evil hates the light, needs come to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that does true, does true, comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are walked in God. So, what am I then with respect to darkness as an unbeliever? I love the darkness. So I, I like it in the dark, and I'd rather stay in the dark, and if somebody turns the light on, I'm bothered by it. You know, and that's why you are, you know, put down many times in your family and in your business and who you work with because your light emanates the light of God. And so the light goes on and it's an annoyance to those that are in darkness. But, but because people in and of themselves like it dark because if the light goes on, it exposes their sin. John, can you read Katie, John 3.36? He that believes on the Son has everlasting life, and he that believes not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So there's a lot here. Number one, your, the wrath of God abides on you. It's hanging over your head as an unbeliever. It's just waiting to fall at any minute. Uh, what was Jonathan Edwards' famous sermon? Anybody know? Wow, none of these pins are working, are they? Uh, the sermon is called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And that sermon, Jonathan Edwards was one of the giants scholastically of the Christian world around the founding of our country. It started something called the First Great Awakening uh, in this country. And Jonathan Edwards went on, and he was the founder, I think, of Princeton uh, University. And the sermon scared him so badly, he didn't want to ever preach it again, because it had this huge effect on everybody that heard it. You can find it online, by the way, and put it on your Kindle. I have a copy of it on my Kindle. And basically, the whole point of it is, is... If you're without Christ, I mean, the judgment of God is just hanging over your head. He uses all this imagery to describe it, you know, like a spider, uh, 
and the spider web is about to collapse and all, all these kinds of things. But it's really based on John 3.36, the wrath of God abides on you. And the Spirit of God was so strong when he preached this sermon in terms of convicting people that people were literally grabbing onto the pews of the church for fear of slipping into hell. And it scared Jonathan Edwards more than anybody else, the effect that it had. He, I don't think he was planning on this effect, but it's all it's this type of thing that you, if you're without Christ, the judgment of God is literally hanging right over your head. It's ready to fall at any second. It's like what's called the sword of Diamocles, which is a sword waiting to fall at any second and chop your head off. And that's the biblical description of the lost. And when you begin to understand people the way God looks at them, now we see the urgency in sharing the gospel with them. So they are under divine judgment. They are without spiritual life. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son has not the life. And the wrath of God abides on him. John 8, 44 So if you're an unbeliever, who's your father? The devil. I mean, you're basically... Yeah, John, you have a question? John Jones? What was that? John 844. If you are without Christ, essentially, you're serving Satan. Your father is Satan, is what it's saying. So you can't get much worse than that, can you? All right, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. John, that's yours, just in case you forgot. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that is now working in the sons of this people. Among them, we too, all formerly dead, blessed now you got to commit five of these I think the question, test question is to memory and here's four of them right here in Ephesians 2 1 through 3 they're all start with the letter D you are dead in other words walking dead people you're alive physically, but you don't have the life of God. That's in verse 1. Number 2, you're demonically energized. Verse 2, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air. Who would that be? Satan. Satan. So you're just, you, all, you just exist to do Satan's will. Number three, you are depraved because you are following, verse three, the lusts of the flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind. And then number four, you're doomed because it says there at the end of verse three that you're a child of wrath. So, dead, verse 1, demonically energized, verse 2, depraved, verse 3, doomed, verse 3. So, you know, the salvation that Christ offers starts looking a lot more inviting, doesn't it? When we see ourselves the way God sees us before we get saved. I certainly didn't look at myself this way as a pre-Christian or before I was a Christian. Just thought I was a pretty cool guy, you know. Uh, Colossians 1.13, uh, moreover we are something else, Colossians 1.13. Did I, I must have not given that out to anybody. 
All right, well, as you're looking there, who has 2 Timothy 2.26? So people are held captive by the devil. What's a snare? It's a trap, right? What's what's it mean to be a captive? You, yeah, you're a prisoner. You can't get out. So how does God look at lost people? They're prisoners of Satan. So screaming at them and arguing with them all the time may not be the best way to go because they can't even get out of the trap they're in. So what do you need to do for them? I would start praying for them. Only God's going to be able to release them from the captivity that they're under. Colossians 1.13 says the same thing. Jo- uh, Joyce has that. Um, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have Yeah, that was, she, uh, Christine had 2 Timothy 2.27. But he's rescued us from the domain of darkness. So we are, we are under the dominion. Do, what does dominion mean? Authority of darkness before we're Christians. Acts 26, 17, and 18. Rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So what do you what happens when you get saved? You're transferred. Well, first of all, your eyes are opened. Do we realize the unsaved people can't see? Unless unless God does something, makes some kind of conviction upon them. You're transferred from the dominion of darkness to the dominion of light or the kingdom of Christ. Dominion means you're in a, in a prison of darkness. So another descriptor of the lost is they're, they're basically under the control. Uh, they're held captive is what I'm trying to say. By the way, they can't even receive truth. Who has 1 Corinthians 2.14? But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. What's what's the natural man? Yeah, there are three types of people, did you know? There are natural men... Who does a natural man is someone who functions body and soul, no spirit at all in him. And then within the ranks of Christians, there are spiritual men. Those are born again people that are yielding to the spirit. And then there's the carnal man, right? Who's the carnal man? Carnal man is the Christian that doesn't yield to the spirit. So you've got three kinds of people here. Now, we're, we'll be talking about the spiritual and carnal man a great deal later in the class, but the natural man, that's the man who has no access to the Spirit at all. The things of the Spirit are what? Foolishness to him. So I get together at our family reunions, my wife and I, around a bunch of people we love but they're unbelievers and they just think my wife and I are completely lost our minds you believe what you believe the earth is 6,000 years old what what kind of uh, ignoramus are you you guys are too smart to believe stuff like that well why can't they get it and and we could we could argue with them and we've been arguing with them for decades it hasn't done any good there has to be some kind of supernatural uh, encounter with God that they have which is what we're praying for but we can yell at them we can argue with them we can email them we can send them articles over the internet that they're supposed to read it won't do any good because angry God and yeah yeah maybe that'll work 
but see, they can't, they cannot, the natural man cannot receive spiritual truth. Because my wife and I are body, soul, spirit. We're trying to talk to people that are only body and soul. We're thinking at a level that they can't think at because we have the Holy Spirit, they don't. It doesn't make us better than them, but we have something inside of us that they don't have. And they can't receive the truth. So, apologetics ministry. Um, can you argue people into the, into the kingdom of God? Uh, I don't... I think if, if whatever apologetics ministry you have using arguments to convince people of the truth of Christianity, I'm not saying those things have no value, but they, they're, they're, they don't mean much unless the Spirit is using them. Can the Spirit use apologetics arguments? Sure. But unless the Spirit of God is doing something in those arguments, the people you're arguing with are unable to receive spiritual things. Personally, I think apologetics has a lot more value to the believer than the unbeliever because it shows the believer reasons for their faith which builds the faith of the believer. I'm not anti-using apologetics arguments to the unsaved. Certainly not anti that at all, but I'm just saying that in and of itself without the Spirit's uh, intervention won't lead anybody to Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. Well, uh, it says, uh, and, if, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, and though, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So the gospel is veiled? <clears throat> what does veiled mean? hidden the unsaved person can't see it they don't understand it by the way if you think that the things of God are stupid and 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14 says that those that think they're foolish are perishing so if you think the things of God are silly that puts you into a dangerous category of persons doesn't it So the unsaved person can't receive the truth. The unsaved person is under the control of Satan's world system who has 1 John 5.19. It says, We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So the whole world, that's a lot of people, isn't it? lies in the lap or the power of the wicked one. So the whole world system is, is being run now by Satan himself. And everybody's just marching as a slave to this system. Um, by the way, Jesus offered, uh, excuse me, Satan offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, right? In the second temptation and Luke's rendition of it. And Jesus never said, well, that's not true. Satan, you can't give all the kingdoms of the world to whom you want, because it is true. It's his kingdom. And that ain't going to change until the second coming. And in the meantime, he deceives the whole world. Uh, Romans 1, 29 through 32. Can I do 28 too? Sure, do it. Uh, Why would I get mad over more Bible? So, I mean, there it says being filled with all unrighteousness. 
and then you what you read verse 28 before it you know where they don't acknowledge God and all this stuff but then it just lists all their sins so it's pretty pretty staggering by the way a lot of people say theology is not practical well you'll notice that they're denying God which is theology right so that relates to gossip that's pretty practical isn't it murder deceit so if you won't acknowledge God in your mind or your heart then it just leads to all these sins that go right along with it well we've already read Romans 3 10 through 18 that, you know that's where no one seeks God that's where Paul's using all those Old Testament verses to sum up the sin problem. One of my favorite ones in there is their throats are an open grave. What does that mean? What's that? Yeah, their, their throat is an open grave. Their tongues keep on deceiving. Verse 13. The poison of asps is under their lips. You see how all those are in quotations there? Those are all Old Testament passages he's using. Notice that the tongue of the unsaved is called poison. What does poison do? It kills. And so the book of Proverbs says there's life and death in the power of the tongue. You can uh, annihilate people through what you say. Read James 3 sometime and you'll, you'll see it. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That's a satanic lie. We, we can, I mean, you know, what, what if I were to get angry about something and then unleash it on my six-year-old at home? In a, just one moment of anger, I can decimate somebody for her whole life. She'll remember what daddy said. And I could say I'm sorry and I take it back, but the fact of the matter is I said it and the scar is there, see? And so that's the power that we have over, you know, with, with what, we, what we speak. Uh, I don't think we have the power to command prosperity to ourselves the way it's taught on TV and things like that. But the name it and claim it movement, you familiar with that movement? I call it the blab it and grab it type of thing <laughs> there is some truth to what they're saying I mean there's total power in, uh, in what we sp what we speak we can edify or we can tear down so my whole mood has changed many times based on emails I get from people you know I've got some very encouraging people that will email me and I've got people that will just want to rip me one side and down the other and my whole my whole mood is determined by which email I just read. By the way, you probably shouldn't read emails that are not signed by somebody. What's that? Yeah, because if someone's going to send you an email that's not signed, they're probably want to drop a bomb on you. So I have a policy: if it, they didn't, if they don't tell me who sent it, then I just delete it. But, but you know, people are like that; they want to just throw a bomb at you. Uh, sometimes, sadly. Okay, so, unable to seek God, conceived in iniquity. We've inherited this sin nature from conception. And then we've already seen Jeremiah 17, 9, which is the idea that the human heart is deceitfully wicked. And the tragic thing of, the, of all of this, here's the tragedy of it all. The tragedy of it is we don't even understand it. I mean, we're, we're this far gone and we're blind to the severity of our condition. We don't even realize what we're like until we begin to analyze things from God's point of view. Who has Luke 18, 10 through 14? I fast twice a week, I pay tithes of all that I do. 
as a tax collector, standing some distance away was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be on me, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. So, one guy had his eyes open, the other guy didn't. The Pharisee, what's he doing there? He, th he, think, he thinks he's got it down. To the point where he can look down on this other guy, who's this, the sinner. But he's not the sinner. So that is the danger of, of not understanding who we are in Adam. We, we have a tendency to clothe ourselves in some kind of self-righteousness, blind to who, who we are in Adam. Adam and Eve didn't get it either. Who has Genesis 3-7? Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves more coverings. So the fall of man has happened. It's brought in horrible consequences, hasn't it? And they just think, oh, I'll fix myself. See, that they don't realize what's happened. That's why God says, where are you? In the uh, following verse, I think it is Genesis 3, 8, where are you? He's not saying, where are you spatially, or I don't know where you are. He's saying, where are you relationally? He, he has to ask them a question because they don't fully comprehend the gravity of what's just happened. Oh, I'll just throw a few fig leaves together and we'll solve it. Why do they think that? Because they're blind to their condition. Paul, prior to his conversion, was blind to his condition when he was Saul. Who has Philippians 3, 2 through 9? Just read uh, 2 through 6 first. Go through um, uh, six. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless. So, what these are the thoughts going through Paul's mind as he's thinking back about how highly he thought of himself before he was saved. So he thought he had it figured out. He thought he, he didn't see himself the way we've described fallen human beings. He says, as to the law, blameless. Now, I don't know how he could think that since he was going around killing people. I've never fully understood it. But in his mind... He, to the law, he was blameless. You know, he mentions all of these things that he was. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, Pharisee, tribe of Benjamin. A, a, from a, he was from the nation of Israel. And then one day, the scales came off his eyes. And he saw himself for what he was. Can you read Christine verses 7 through 9? So what happened to him? All these things that he was trusting in, he started to count as loss. Verse 8, more than that, I count things to be loss in view of the surpassing uh, value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish. The word for rubbish in Greek 
is scubula, which means manure. Dung or manure, animal excrement. So all of these things that he thought, all the self-righteousness he was clothing himself in. Adam and Eve clothing themselves with fig leaves. Once his eyes were open to his true condition, he, he basically sees it all as manure. That's quite a change in philosophy, isn't it? That's, that's, what, that's what has to happen to people. Um, and when it happens, it's nothing short of a miracle. It really is nothing short of a miracle because we, don't, we are so blind to who we are. God has to really do some kind of number on us. Verse 9, and may be found in him, look at this, this may be the most important verse in the Bible right here, and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. I mean, if you had one, if you were stuck on a desert island and you could only have one verse of the whole Bible, I, that might be a good one to pick because that capsulizes Christianity. That is describing one of the imputations, right? Which one? The hematological one, the Christological one, or the soteriological one? It's the soteriological one. What, what do we need given our <laughs> depraved condition? We need Christ's righteousness transferred to me. That's what I need. So it's not about me standing in the presence of God one day through my own loin coverings that I stitched together. It's not about me standing in the presence of God one day on the basis of the fact that I'm a Hebrew and I'm a kept the law and blah, blah, blah. It's on the basis of his righteousness transferred to me. So why don't people just jump up and down and cheer? Because it takes away pride, doesn't it? You have been saved by grace through faith so that no one may boast. God has set the whole thing up so no one can brag about it. But you see, the human heart is so wicked, we want to do something to merit favor from God rather than have him just give us a gift. Because if he just gives me a gift, is it not hard to receive a gift from people? I mean, I've received some very strong gifts from people that I don't deserve. And frankly, it's always hard for me to receive it because then I can't brag about what I have. You see what I'm saying? I mean, my parents, one of the things they did for me is they paid for all my college. Now, that, that bothered me because I wanted to say, well, I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps and made it on my own, which I did not do. My parents came in and subsidized my college education. That's a, that's a blow to my pride. In, in essence, Christ comes along and says, I will make you positionally righteous in a nanosecond. And we say, well, I, I don't want it that, I don't want that because that's too easy. I mean, where's room for me to contribute? And the offer is you can't contribute anything to it. You receive it as a gift or it's not coming your way. And many people turn it down. Galatians 5.11 calls the gospel, therefore, something. Who has that? John, you have that. Okay, the cross is called a what? Stumbling. Stumbling block or an offense. Why is it called an offense? Because what does it attack? Pride. Pride. It attacks works orientation. 
do we understand that we are the only uh, system of thought, religiously, if I can use that word, where we're not trying to climb up some ladder to get stuff from God on our own merits? Everybody else, I don't care if it's Catholicism, Mormonism, Buddhism, misunderstood Judaism, everybody else out there is say Islam talk to a Muslim they'll say there's two scales and as long as this scale of good outweighs the scale of bad they're in so their whole system is based on works Mormonism is based on works Roman Catholicism is based on works uh, whatever system you want to come Scientology Engrams, good engrams, outweigh bad engrams, Scientology, Christian science works, New Age movement works. And here we're, here we're saying works are filthy rags to God, you receive it as a free gift. So why isn't, why isn't everybody running into our camp? Because our camp takes away pride. It's an attack on pride, that's why. God has set the whole thing up so once you get it, you can't brag about it, and that, that's hard for human beings to do. So the great, and this is why, because we're so blind to our sinful condition, that's why the gospel, when it's preached, is offensive. And you have to understand that when you preach this, you will offend people. So anyway, that's a little bit about man's estimate of the law. Any, any questions on that? Uh huh. Um, we're going to deal with that, but faith without works is dead is not saying the way it's typically preached. Okay. If you don't have works, you never had faith. Right. That's 99% of the teaching you get on it. Dead in the Bible, thanatos is the word. It never means anywhere in the Bible non existence. Because if you were to die right now, would you stop existing? No. You'd continue on, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And even an unbeliever, when they die, they don't stop existing. They go into Hades, Luke 16. So faith without works is dead. Dead does not mean non-existence. Dead means uselessness or ineffectiveness but not non-existence. So the issue in the book of James is, J James, see, and this is the problem that people have. They quote one paragraph from the book without doing a study of the whole book. The whole book clearly tells them that they're believers that he's addressing. They're called brethren over and over again in the book. He says they've been born again in the book. He says your faith is being matured, which implies they have it. So the eternal destiny of the readers is never is not questioned at all in James' epistle. What is being questioned is the fact that their faith is not translating into good works, and so consequently these people, God can't use them for his purposes on the earth. So when James says faith without works is dead, he's not questioning the eternal destiny of his readers. What he's questioning is your faith is not being productive for God on the earth. He's, he's dealing with dead orthodoxy. People that are saved and going to heaven, but God is not using their lives the way he wants to use them. Does that make sense? And just kind of hang in there with me on it, because I know that's when people hear this, it freaks them out a little bit, because it's different than anything they've ever been taught. But I'll try to unpack it when we get into soteriology. So the only thing we have left to cover is the two natures of the believer. We'll finish uh, hammer theology next week, and then we'll review for the test. So don't miss next week, because we're going to be reviewing for the test. And uh, I'll see y'all next time.